Okay, on the beat. A one, a two, a three, a four. We all live in a yellow submarine. The blue men is are coming. All right, lads. Time to stow the gap and turn to... Groovy. What's happening, John? Well, in my humble opinion, we've become involved in Einstein's time-space continuum theory. Oh, I. Relatively speaking, that is. Of course. That land is a tickle of joy on the blue belly of the universe. Welcome back to the Yellow Sub Sandwich, a podcast celebrating the fact that the Beatles' Yellow Submarine is back on the big screen across the UK, Ireland and US from July, marking its 50th anniversary. You can find all you need to know about where you can see the movie and book tickets at yellowsubmarine.film. I'm Edith Bowman and I'm here with The Telegraph's film critic Robbie Collin, commissioning editor of film and music on The Times, Ed Potton, and one of the original animators on Yellow Submarine, Malcolm Draper. If you haven't heard part one, then stop now, because this is part two. In part one, we heard from writer-director Edgar Wright, filmmaker Chris Shepard and Ardman Animation's Peter Lord on why you should have gone to see Yellow Submarine in the cinema. So hopefully... You're here because you did. Um, can I take you all back to the first time you saw it? Robbie, what was your reaction the first time you saw this film? Because I saw the film for the first time as an adult, it was this sense of amazement that this was the source, the, the, the wellspring of all these amazing things that I loved in animation, pop culture, all over the place. This was a kind of a focal point where they pushed through from the avant-garde to the mainstream. It was, it was a real kind of turning point, not just in the medium of animation, uh, but in terms of what you could really show and different things you could you could portray in, in pop culture in general. And it was realising that all of this traced back to, to, to this one film. But in terms of what you thought of the film, what did you think of the film the first time you saw it? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. But I was very bamboozled by it because of the, the, <laughs> this idea that you, you were kind of tracing back. And, and it was things that, you know, I associated with, with the 60s and with psychedelia and with, with, mm. with pop art at the time, op art. The, the Bridget Riley sequence in the, the Sea of Holes, which is just this kind of wonderful dimension snapping thing where people, you know, pop a, a head through here and a foot through there. It was this idea that you could kind of take this madness, this lunacy out of the art gallery and put it on the cinema screen in, in a format that would be beloved by, you know, children and adults alike. That was really, really stuck with me. Ed, what about for you? Um, I think I saw it when I was about eight or nine and I had that thing that kids have where you're incredibly blasé about supernatural, amazing totally. things. So, you know, oh yeah, you would have these kind of blue creatures running around. You <laughs> would have this kind of floating, pointing finger and, you know, that's that's completely in keeping with how the world works. And also, I mean, I think probably like many people who saw it when they were children, I had no idea that the voices weren't the Beatles' own voices. So I assumed it was John, Paul, George and Ringo doing their thing and, it, and, it, and I didn't really kind of see a particular dividing line between live action stuff and that. I just thought, you know, this of the Beatles in a cartoon and that's just how the world is and it's great. I think there's almost a point of, of on the age that you see it, it's a different experience every time, you know, almost each generation you would have a different experience and reaction to seeing the film. Um, Malcolm, for you, can you remember actually seeing the film in its finished form um, for the first time after spending, you well, know, so much time? I think at the end of it, yeah, there was a screening of it, I forget where, and we all went up, all, all trips along to see it. And we we all loved it. I mean, we obviously recognised bits we worked on and stuff like that. And it just brought back memories of that whole year. And um, to me, it's just it was the most exciting year of my life. I mean, I can't, I, can't uh, I never equaled it. Did you, you have know? any idea at the time that it was something that would uh, inspire and just explode a whole new? Yeah, well, we, form we, thought of animation. Go, we thought it would become, well, I'm not going to say the word iconic, I mean, it's too soon, but we thought it would, it would become a landmark film because it was so different the way we d it was done, you know. Um, and we hoped it would <laughs> become. And um, it did influence a lot of stuff after. I, I remember going, seeing lots of adverts on television influenced by it, different styles of drawing and things like that when animation was drawn in those days. Um, yeah, it, it did influence a lot of uh, fashion and everything else. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing is it crossed so many different things. Yeah. But within film and within animation, you know, in, in part one, Robbie, you mentioned Terry Gillingham and Python and stuff. And, and that's incredibly obvious. Even things like The Simpsons and all that kind of stuff, I really feel like, it. you know, it's something that inspired that. And Some of the humour, I think, did, yeah. 
definitely. Yeah. What was the critical response and what was the fan response to it? Robbie, have you got any idea in terms of It was of critically that? very well received. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting is it was marketed in the UK as being a children's film. And I think it was, critics didn't necessarily receive it as such, but it didn't really catch the public imagination in the same way as it did in the States, where they, they sold it much more as being a film of the moment. And it was something for, you know, mass audiences, but not just for children. You know, you could go along if you're interested. It, it's kind of, it reminds me slightly of the, the way in which uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey was really fumbled as being this, um, this kind of high art experience. And it was only when they worked out that, you no, know, it had to be sold as this kind of, what was described at the time as a head movie. It was the, a film that you went to be taken out of yourself. I also think it was the start of film being cross generations, you know, in terms of the way that Pixar now is a film that you could sit down with your two, three year old and watch and you both get something from it. I think this was the start of that in terms of it 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 tapped into the mentality of different generations. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean this is something that animation directors get hung up on all the time is that this this is not an art form that's only for children. You know, you can go to see uh, even a new Pixar film, like you know, something like Incredibles, you could go to see that without a child in tow. You don't need to have this kind of beard in order to get into the cinema uh, to, to enjoy a film like that properly. And I think Yellow Submarine, it probably illustrated that to a mass audience for the first time. I mean, we've spoken about how this film was received by an audience and, and critics uh, at the time, but we, we also wondered about how children today would receive this film. So we have some reactions from young cinema goers having seen Yellow Submarine for the first time. My favourite bit of the movie Yellow Submarine is when they go through the Sea of Holes. The Sea of Holes is um, a sea they go to where there are lots of holes you can go down and Ringo, one of the main characters, picks picks one of the holes up in his pocket and later in the movie he uses it to set free the other band called Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. They're black and white and it looks like Victoria. It looks a bit Victoria. I like the line where George says, it's all in the mind. <laughs> I liked it when there was the, um, the monster thing with the big tube nose and when Ringo was riding on that horse. I loved Yellow Submarine because I used to sing it at my play school. I really liked it on the journey in the Yellow Submarine. I liked the ending because the Beatles beat the Blue Meanies with love. I thought it was really good and funky and something to enjoy because it's funny and weird. My favourite songs were um, All Together Now and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds because it made me feel very magical. The film is very funny and has villains called the meanies that are blue and very mean and they have a lot of desire, desire to annihilate. Wow, good words. <laughs> Massive thank you to Victor, Iris, Libby, Edward and Florence for their fabulous honesty. So many great things in that. Impressive vocabulary. I know. We should have given a massive spoiler alert before that section as well, <laughs> just in case you were listening to this and you haven't seen the film. Very lively, happy musical. I love how they pulled out colours and shapes and stuff. And it made me feel magical as well, which is really interesting. And that was specifically with the Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds sequence. And that was done with a specific animation technique called rotoscoping, which is where you will trace over live action footage. And I think some of the, the, the footage in that sequence came from Top Hat, if I'm right. Or there were some old kind yeah, of uh, yes, uh, so. early Hollywood musicals that were that were used, dance dance films, in order yeah. to provide the, the moves for that. And rotoscoping does have that magical feel to it because it's not, you know, you're not drawing poses that read easily you're copying from from life which gives it that really strange visual texture what's your response to those comments from those children? i love them it was, it was del del delightful delightful yeah who's all your favorite characters malcolm i was very fond of jeremy um Nora man. Nora man yeah i love him and that lovely song too i love the kind of dr zeusness to his kind you know that yeah. kind of old sort of the the, the, the rhyme and everything yeah yeah it's great medic pedic z oblique Orphic, morphic, dorphic, Greek. Ad hoc, ad lock, and quid pro quo. So little time. Ha <laughs> ha, so much to know. Look, can you tell us where we're at? A true Socratic query, that. Oh, yeah. I know the bully shears are you. Who? 
Ah, who indeed am I? Jeremy. Hillary. Boob. Fud. There's one of a scene which one of the guys in our unit, Arthur Humberstone, the, the old gent, you know, with the bow tie, he um, did a scene where Jeremy enters the Yellow Submarine for the first time and he's feeling with his feet, his toes down the, the ladder. Yeah. It's beautifully done and nice. It's one of the best pieces of animation I've seen. And good old Arthur did that, yeah. Red, your favourite character? Well, I mean, Ringo is obviously the kind of most obviously entertaining Beatle, but I, I really like the Chief Blue Meanie, actually. I think he's a really good villain. He's creepy, yeah. but I, I do love the way there's this kind of rapprochement at the end and they're kind of bonding. It's... And that animation uh, was done in America afterwards by a guy called Dwayne Crowther, um, who I work with in America too. Um, a, a great animator, and he did a lot of the Chief Meanie stuff, brilliantly drawn and animated. <laughs> are coming. Not your young Fred. They wouldn't dare. They would. They are. What are you going to do? They're a perfect level of scary and creepiness. They're not too monstrous and too yeah. disturbing, yeah. but they're, yeah. they're just disturbing enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Robbie, you got a favourite character? Um, yeah, I'm going to be boring and say Ringo because, <laughs> to me, I, never, I didn't really really understand Ringo's role in the Beatles until you see him he in live drummer, action. He was the drummer, Robbie. No, no, sure, like <laughs> instrumentally, yes, yeah, okay, the great drummer. But to understand who, what he kind of stood for, if you see him in A Hard Day's Night, you're like, oh, okay, so that's who Ringo was. And the fact that that was so brilliantly captured mm. by the animators and by Paul Angelus as well. Oh, your story has touched me heart. Sean Penn will get me friends. Oh, bless you. Did I sneeze? We should talk a little bit about how characters were captured in that way because, you know, Ringo's... Um, you, can, you can see his, his, the way in which he even walks through the film. You know, he's got a different walk cycle to the other Beatles. He's smaller and he's kind of trotting along behind him like this kind of schoolboy-like character. I mean, can you talk us through how, how you would kind of transpose the, the physicality of the, yeah. the, the bandmates? I did a, a, a scene where the four, four of them are walking along, I think, to All You Need Is Love and leaving a row of flowers behind them, you know. And we had to work out different steps for each character. And whether I did it consciously or unconsciously, I don't know. It, 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 they, you got the character and you, you just, I saw in my mind's eye, yes, his, he wouldn't, his step wouldn't be as wide, it was as stretched as, say, George, who was taller and longer legs. <laughs> um, I don't they, know. They, they kind of magnify the height differences, don't they? Because, yeah. I mean, John yeah. seems to be a, sort of a full head taller than Ringo in some of the yeah. sequences. I like that bit where um, where Ringo's character goes back to get the Nowhere Man to bring him into the, the submarine mm. and he does that kind of, it, almost kind of like, it, it's where part of uh, Monty Python got the Ministry of Silly Walks from, I am convinced, because he does that kind of hands on his hips, oh, yeah. really yeah. wide, yeah. stretchy, yes. Yes. stretchy walk sort of things. <laughs> well, listen, um, when it came out in 1960, animation was very two-dimensional. Yellow Submarine changed all that. Here's Paul McCartney and Peter Lord. As much as you can capture people's characters in a cartoon drawing, uh, an animation piece, I think they did pretty well, really. Catching character through performance in animation is a very difficult thing. And I do think of our work at Ardman that we kind of pioneered it. I mean, we weren't the only people doing it. But back in the mid-70s when we started, one of the things that we did was we animated so that the characters were expressive, so that you could understand who they were and what they were thinking through the way they moved. Now, the Yellow Submarine was also doing that in a stylized way, but it a very impressive way. Paul McCartney and Peter Lord there. And um, one of the things I find amazing in, in considering that the Beatles, you know, they weren't they didn't do the voices and they weren't involved in the script writing or any of that kind of thing. And from you talking about how, oh, now I know about Ringo, is how they nailed it with regards to the characterization of those people. I think that was one of the things that maybe they, they did a lot of groundwork on with the Beatles TV show, which, you know, as demonised by some people as it has been, that series actually let them, over a long period of time, work on the mannerisms and the interaction and the walking and things like that, maybe. And, of course, something we can talk about now is this incredibly bizarre live-action epilogue at the end of the film where the Beatles all show up in person and do this little skit about Blue Beanies descending on the theatre. Hey, look at John, will ya? What's the matter, John, love? Blue meanies? 
Newer and bluer meanies have been sighted within the vicinity of this theatre. Oh. There's only one way to go out. How's that? Singing! One, two, three, ah! One, two, three, four. Can I have a little more? Five, six. They weren't seven, really that nine, involved with this, as we've discussed, but they had to give something of themselves. This was their kind of concession on that front. My understanding is that sequence was originally meant to be much more elaborate and the, the, this black background behind them was going to be transformed into some kind of animated psychedelic landscape and it just didn't happen. I think the production ran out of time or, 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 or money or for some reason and so it just ended up with these four guys in kind of muddy brown shirts sitting in front of a, a black wall. I think they've got to have been happy with it after it was finished and I know they went in with sort of slight trepidation about it as to what it was going to be from their previous experience and it was a contractual thing to finish this three picture deal and stuff but when it hit that point of the film being finished and it being out in the public and people's response to it they've got to have been happy with the finished article. I think article. they probably were. I, I, <laughs> I don't know but I, mean, I assume they, they were because why not? You know, It's uh, made them even, even more popular. <laughs> Well, we've actually got some audio of George, Paul and Ringo talking about the film. The thing that I liked most about the movie was we didn't really have to do anything to, to, to it. They just took the music, we met with them, they talked about basically what they were going to do. Heinz Edelman was fantastic, he went off and created all these characters. And um, that was basically it, and then they completed the movie and we just did that little piece at the end. They said, you've got to be in at the end of it. And we said, oh, no, you know, we just spoofed it in the end. It's like, oh, I've got a hole. Oh, a hole to... Huh? I can't remember the line. Well, it was always fun when the four of us could ham it up, you know, and hang out together and, uh, you know, it was scripted in its way, but, you know, we always had that looseness between us that we could, if somebody went off, we could all join in on that. We didn't, like, stop. Oh, my God, he said, you know, the, a wrong word. It was just all in the day's work for the Fab Four. <laughs> Feels like the right place to end, gentlemen. That's it from us on the Yellow Sub Sandwich. Thanks for listening. For more information, head over to the film's website at yellowsubmarine.film. If you braved the spoilers in this part and you haven't yet booked your tickets, then the film is back on the big screen in cinemas across the UK and Ireland from Sunday the 8th of July and across in the US from July 8th through August the 31st. You can get your tickets right now from that website, yellowsubmarine.film. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, Ed, Robbie and Malcolm, thank you so much. You're welcome. You. It's been thank a you. great pleasure too. Yeah, it was a great party. Oh. And we brought back lots of lovely souvenirs. Here is the motor. And I've got a little love. And I've got a hole in my pocket. Oh. A hole? We are